Hi, we're now speaking to Professor Liebman on his recent paper that was published in PNAS on Native American um, depopulation and reforestation. So, Professor Liebman, um, could you give us a quick summary of the paper, please? Sure, thanks for having me. Um, so, our paper investigates um, uh, what happened to Native American populations in the Southwest US following the earliest contacts with Europeans. Um, we know that native populations uh, declined after uh, European contact, but uh, there are large debates uh, in the scholarly literature about the magnitude of that decline and the timing of that uh, decline. So we were really trying to narrow down in the specific case in New Mexico, um, uh, when decline began, how steep was the decline, um, and uh, ultimately what effects did that decline have on the, uh, the local environment, um, and what implications could that have for the larger uh, global uh, environment. Um, so uh, there are kind of two bodies of scholarship that are driving this literature. One is the Native American depopulation literature and uh, questions about when that happens. And the other is um, recent literature on um, the Anthropocene. Uh, and um, uh, if uh, you're a person who ascribes to the notion that humans have fundamentally changed um, the, uh, the, the global environment, a human caused um, uh, climatic change, then um, what would the start date for that um, be and what were the causes of that? So traditionally people have said, if, if you're going to ascribe to the notion of an Anthropocene, people started either at um, the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century or um, the use of atomic weapons. But um, uh, last year there was a paper in Science that suggested um, actually 1610 would be the best uh, start date. And it was because of a global dip in um, CO2 at that time, which they linked to Native American depopulation. So the other thing we were trying to do in the paper was um, quantify depopulation um, with an eye to this question about the start date of the Anthropocene, basically whether or not the dip in um, CO2 that we saw um, uh, really was caused by Native American depopulation or whether depopulation happened at a different time that was out of phase with that, um, with that uh, uh, dip in CO2. So um, the way we went about doing this was first we had to figure out um, how many people were in the area that we're studying. We're, we're looking at an area of New Mexico um, that's um, west of uh, the state capital at Santa Fe, north of Albuquerque. Um, if anybody watches Breaking Bad, it's right in the area where uh, Breaking Bad took place. Um, and there's an extensive archaeological record uh, in this area. So we looked at 18 um, Pueblo villages, the remains of 18 Pueblo villages, and we measured the architecture in those villages so that we could come up with uh, population estimates about how many people were living there uh, at that time. Um, the reason nobody had done this before is it's really difficult to um, uh, get accurate maps of these villages to estimate the architecture, but we use a new technology called LIDAR, um, uh, which um, basically um, uh, a plane flies over and shoots lasers down at the ground and comes up with a really accurate map of the ground. And the advantage of LIDAR is that it can penetrate the tree canopy so it can see right uh, through trees. So um, many of these sites are underneath Ponderosa Pine uh, Forest. And so LIDAR gave us for the first time a map of the entire region that gave us uh, uh, accurate measurements of the sizes of these um, uh, villages. Previously, we were mapping them um, by hand, and it would take you know up to a year to produce a map for a single village. So um, with, with this technology, we had uh, all 18 of the villages uh, that we used in the study, literally in an instant, we had, we had that data. So once we were able to measure the, um, the amount of architecture, we converted that into what we thought was uh, a, a, a good estimate of how many people would have lived uh, in, in those uh, uh, rooms. Um, and we actually produced a range because we're not sure how much of the village would have been occupied at any one given time. So we estimated between 50 and 80% of the uh, architecture because some rooms could have been built after the period we're interested in. Some would have been built before and had gone out of use. Um, and then we needed to figure out when people stopped living at those villages. And so to do that, um, my colleague Josh Farella uh, conducted a study of the trees that were growing on these sites. Usually when archaeologists use 
uh, tree rings to date sites. We're actually interested in the outer rings of the trees because that tells us when they were cut down and usually used um, in architecture. So as, as roof beams or supporting architecture in a, in a home. But what we did that was different was we actually were interested in the earliest dates that trees were growing on the site. So we looked at trees that were still growing on the sites today or sometimes were um, stumps that had been uh, uh, trees that had died in the recent past. And we looked at the, the inner ring, so the earliest dates of those trees, when those trees established and started growing on these sites. And uh, what we found when we did this was that we we're seeing patterns at these sites where um, the earliest dates of tree establishment were clustering right in the uh, 1630s and 1640s. And that was telling us that people were no longer living at these villages because when people lived there, they pretty much cut down all the trees because they needed to use them for um, firewood, for heating. There's, there, this is an area that gets snow in the, in the winters, so heating and cooking and also um, to build their homes. So when people lived there, there were no trees growing there. When people leave the sites, that's when we start to get the forest regenerating in those areas. And so the patterns we saw were that uh, trees were starting to grow in the 1630s and 1640s. And then we had a second part of the study that looked at um, tree rings from throughout the region, not just at the archeological sites, but from a bigger sample throughout the region. Um, and uh, um, recorded in tree rings are um, scars from forest fires. So when a forest fire burns through, it can leave a scar on a tree that we can then um, uh, uh, calculate the year of that fire. So we also came up with a regional um, pattern of, of fires over the years and we saw that that aligned with what we were seeing in the forest regrowth. So we started to see um, much more widespread forest fires occurring in the mid 17th century. So right around the time after we had uh, the, the trees regrowing <coughs> on these villages. Um, and so when we combine that data along with um, some historical data from the earliest Spaniards living in the region, we saw that um, it was uh, 1620s when um, the Franciscan priests established mission churches in the region. And the, in the 1620s and 30s, they tell us that epidemic diseases uh, swept through. Um, and uh, so from that, we are able to conclude that uh, the people vacated the region um, uh, primarily between 1620 and um, 1640, 50. And at that same time, we see trees that regrow and widespread forest fires. Um, it's important to note that people weren't wiped out uh, entirely. The, the Hamas region lost 87% of its population in a 60-year um, period, but there is still a, a, a group of uh, Hamas people living in this area. The Hamas tribe has the reservation just south of our study area, excuse me, and they were partners with us um, on this uh, research project. And today they have about 2,000 people living on the tribal lands just outside of the research area. Um, so the population has uh, rebounded significantly um, from the time period that we're studying uh, in our, our paper in PNAS. So why was the all the illnesses swept through and then all the trees can start growing again. <laughs> right, sorry, I missed the first part of that. Um, so why was there a time when it was all fine um, and then people started disappearing sort of thing? Right, so of course, um, you know, going back into uh, the, the, the 1400s and early 1500s, um, there, there were no Europeans uh, to contend with. Um, of course, uh, you know, Columbus lands in, in 1492. Um, and in the region that we're studying, first direct contacts happen in uh, 1539 to 1541 in this in this region. <coughs> um, so uh, the 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 question for us is why did disease not happen in um, 1540 or maybe even early in 1520 when there's first contact um, in uh, Mexico City, Cortez. Uh, leads an expedition, and we know um, from both archaeological and historical literature that um, the the population of central Mexico is uh, diminished um, uh, by similar orders of magnitude uh, in the 1520s and 30s. Um, previous uh, scholarship had suggested that um, it was possible that pandemic diseases start at that time sweeping all throughout North and South America. Um, 
And so uh, there's a demographer named Henry Dobbins who was really the, the first proponent of this theory. Um, and we do see that pattern occurring in some parts of the world. So in the Andes, for example, in South America, it's pretty clear that waves of disease seem to sweep through there prior to um, the time that Pizarro uh, uh, engages with the, the Inca empire. Um, and based on that, people were projecting, well, maybe this happened all over North America as well. Um, so that disease wipes, strikes through. And the picture that we get from the first people to actually enter what's now the United States was a world that was radically transformed already. They were essentially entering a, a post-apocalyptic world, a Mad Max kind of world, according to this, uh, this theory. Um, uh, so when we started this research, you know, uh, one of the questions was where were we going to see that depopulation back in the um, 1500s, uh, as people had suggested before. Um, so what happens in the valley that we're studying is there's just sporadic contacts between uh, 1540 and uh, 1620, meaning there are Spaniards who come into the area as explorers, there are occasional priests that come and visit, but never stay for longer than um, maybe a few months, but almost everybody usually just 24 to 48 hours uh, and, and leave. Um, and so um, in 1620, we get the establishment of uh, mission churches and um, a long-term day-to-day interactions between the native people and Europeans. Um, however, it's, uh, a pretty small number of Europeans at that time. There's uh, one Franciscan priest for much of that time, and there would have been occasional visitors, but not a huge number. So one of the, the questions we have in the future is, um, you know, uh, what really caused the depopulation that we see after the missions uh, go up? And that's something we didn't uh, address in this paper. What we see in the paper is just the timing that when those missions go up in 1620, that seems to be the straw that broke the camel's back, as it were, and it's after those day-to-day -day interactions that we see um, disease affect uh, in, in a large scale and, and really have a, a, a significant effect on uh, the, the Hamas population. So it needed sort of more people to actually be getting contact day-to-day -day for the actual illnesses and the diseases to start spreading. So the question is, was it people? And maybe it was people. We know in other cases where it is, but also I, what my... Um, Hypothesis is, is probably that it had more to do with livestock. So um, you have a few Spaniards on the ground, but what they're bringing with them are sheep and cattle and horses. And probably what's going on is it's after 1620 that the Hamas people have much more intensive daily interactions with livestock. Um, now, again, we didn't address this in the paper, um, and so I haven't been able to test this hypothesis yet, but um, I suspect that it's... Uh, the interaction with livestock. Livestock are probably the vectors for at least some of this disease, and it and that could be the, the reason that it took until 1620 for it to take off. Not so much the interaction between um, people, but the people and animal uh, interaction. Because, of course, um, in the Americas, there was no domesticated livestock um, prior to uh, the uh, introduction of, of European colonial settlements. So. It's a really interesting theory. Um, so what's next for the research? Is it to look into the livestock impact? Um, um, so I'd like to do that. Yeah, we're going to, uh, I hope to um, maybe get access to some data and see um, just how much livestock uh, was introduced at the time. There is a, a mission village, um, uh, one of the 18 villages that we studied here um, that has been excavated a number of times over the years. So I'd really like to um, look back at the previous excavations and, and um, look at um, the, the faunal remains, the animal remains from there and see what kind of, um, uh, uh, what kind of presence that, that sheep and, and cattle um, uh, and horses had uh, at that time. Um, we're also continuing to partner with the tribe on this uh, research. So one of the things we were doing was tracking the um, interactions with wildfires over this period. Um, uh, in the, the past 10 years uh, in this area of uh, the U.S., wildfires have grown to become an incredible problem, and especially for um, the tribe that we're working with. They have uh, 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 both natural and cultural resources that they're uh, intensely concerned with in this area that are threatened by 
uh, wildfires. So we're also interested in looking more at the long-term um, interactions with wildfire. Basically, how did we have uh, five to 8,000 people living in this region for um, hundreds or maybe even thousands of years um, and not triggering the kind of wildfires that we see going on uh, in the region today? <clears throat> and so what lessons can we learn for management of the natural resources today from how those people were managing their resources in the past? So we're continuing to work with the tribe to identify the um, questions that are really of interest uh, with them. So um, we were out uh, in October this year meeting with the tribal council um, to, to talk about further research and we'll be back out in June. And the idea is really to um, have the interests of the um, local Native American groups driving our research more than uh, having us researchers just come in and, and kind of foist our questions uh, upon them. So we're really hoping for this to be uh, a communally driven uh, research project in our, in our next directions. Oh, sounds like a really nice partnership. It's really good work. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much for doing the interview. Um, we'll put a link to the paper below this video. Um, thanks again. Great. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye.